In the heart of big cities, life moves at the speed of a click. Instant deliveries, taxi services at your doorstep, and roads that connect every corner make you forget about the challenges of distance. But as you move away from the well-lit streets and towering skyscrapers towards the untamed wilderness, the story changes. Here, in the remote corners of Alaska, Yukon, and other vast wilderness areas, roads are scarce, if they exist at all. There's no Uber to call, no delivery service that brings dinner to your door. Instead, the skies become the highways and the rivers become the roads. In these areas, aviation is not a luxury, it's a necessity. From delivering essential supplies to remote communities, evacuating patients in critical conditions, aiding in firefighting, and search and rescue missions, to enabling wildlife research in hard to reach areas, this plane is at the heart of it all. Welcome to the history of the de Havilland Canada II Beaver. When writing about an airplane named after its designer or manufacturer, we cannot bypass the history of de Havilland Canada itself. And before we begin, I would like to ask you to leave this video a like and subscribe to our channel. Your activity truly helps us to gain traction as our channel is still quite young, but we truly do our best to provide quality content about the wonders of aviation and value each one of you who supports us on our journey. Meet Geoffrey de Havilland. An interesting fact is that D before the surname stands for from, so technically one of Geoffrey's ancestors was born in Havilland, not the one in Kansas though. Geoffrey himself was born in 1882 in Buckinghamshire. He then studied engineering at the Crystal Palace School of Engineering, and upon graduating, he took an apprenticeship at Williams and Robinsons, manufacturers of steam engines, steam turbines, diesel motors, and generators. But what truly sparked the young genius was aviation. During the next decade, de Havilland built his own aircraft, a biplane, which he immediately crashed. However, he then built a second one, which was more successful. A few years later in 1910, de Havilland sold that plane, which he used to learn to fly, to his boss. Little did he know that this particular plane would become the foundation of the FE-1, the first aircraft to bear an official Royal Aircraft Factory designation. In 1920, de Havilland, a mature and respected technical director and chief designer for the British aircraft manufacturer Airco, found himself unemployed after the company was purchased and subsequently closed. Undeterred, he decided to establish his own company, de Havilland Aircraft Company Limited. The new company began by completing an unfulfilled Airco order. In 1925, De Havilland introduced the Moth, an aircraft of his own design. Its success was so significant that he took the company public in 1928 and decided to establish subsidiaries in Australia and Canada to manufacture the Moth. The parent company would eventually merge with others and disappear entirely. The Australian subsidiary would be purchased by Boeing and renamed Boeing Aerostructures Australia, but the Canadian offshoot took on a life of its own and is still in existence today over 90 years later. Going back to the 1930s, de Havilland Canada became widely known for their moths. These were a series of light aircraft, sports planes, and military trainers. At that time, they were the most common civilian aircraft flying in Britain, and every light aircraft flying in the UK was commonly referred to as a moth, regardless of whether it was built by de Havilland or not. And while there are many honorable mentions of aircraft built by de Havilland during times of war, Let's focus on the hero of today's video, the Beaver. Shortly after the end of Second World War, de Havilland, expecting a drop of military orders, decided to research the civilian sector. While DHC understood the loss of competing with big established companies like Boeing, instead of going the big commercial aviation path, they've pursued the sector that desperately needed attention and innovation. Wilderness pilots flying in the remote and rugged terrains of rural territories, de Havilland realized that these territories needed a special kind of aircraft, one that could tackle their unique needs head on. Thus began the journey of creating the perfect bush plane. Instead of turning to designers and engineers alone, de Havilland sought the insights of the very people who would fly this plane, the bush pilots. They sent out a questionnaire seeking to understand what the pilots really needed, the challenges they faced, and the features they wanted in their ideal aircraft. The response was overwhelming and provided invaluable insights that would shape the design of the Beaver. The Bush pilots highlighted the need for an aircraft that could handle heavy loads, 
take off and land in short distances, operate from rough and unprepared surfaces, and withstand the harsh conditions of the wilderness. They wanted an aircraft that was reliable, rugged, and easy to maintain. De Havilland took these insights to heart, and in autumn 1946, the work began. Believe it or not, the Beaver's unique stall characteristics are a result of British bureaucracy. When the Beaver was still under British ownership, the leadership pushed for the plane to be equipped with the de Havilland Gypsy engine. Although I couldn't find the exact model they intended to use, these engines typically range from 80 to 130 horsepower. And when you put such an engine into a relatively big all-metal plane, well, it doesn't stall. The solution was to increase the wingspan in the hope of decreasing the length of the runway needed. But then, Pratt and Whitney Canada, watching all the engines built for the military planes, now collecting dust in their warehouse, came to de Havilland and offered them for a very low price. So, de Havilland now ended up with 450 horsepower radial engines in the plane, which had its fuselage constructed with the idea of a 130 horsepower engine. Tested in war, the engine's reliability was a key aspect, as maintenance opportunities in the wilderness are limited. Additionally, the radial engine's design is less susceptible to damage from foreign objects. A critical feature when operating from unprepared surfaces. The Beaver's fuselage is built to withstand the rigors of bush flying. It was designed with a semi-monocoque structure, a design that offers strength and durability. Fred Buller, one of the key designers of the Beaver, envisioned the fuselage to be made of steel from the engine to the firewall, heavy aluminum truss frames with panels and doors throughout the front seat area, lighter trusses toward the rear, and all monocoque construction aft. The use of corrosion-resistant alloys also helps extend the aircraft's lifespan, especially when operating in harsh environments or on water. The high-wing design was chosen for several reasons. It provides excellent visibility for the pilot, a critical factor when flying in remote areas with potential hazards. This visibility later became a selling point for dozens of beavers acquired for rescue missions by many countries around the world. The high wing configuration also keeps the wings and propeller clear of ground debris when landing on rough, unprepared surfaces. The beaver was designed to operate from land, water, and snow, making it incredibly versatile. For land operations, Beaver got sturdy, large, low-pressure tires, ideal for landing on unprepared surfaces. These tires distribute the weight of the aircraft evenly, reducing the pressure exerted on any single point. This design allows the Beaver to land on a variety of rough terrain, from grassy fields and gravel strips to dirt paths in the wilderness. Another popular option, especially in Alaska, floats, transforming the Beaver into a true water creature. These floats allow it to land on and take off from water, which is particularly useful in regions with numerous lakes, rivers, or coastal waters, but limited land-based runways. The design of these floats also incorporates small wheels, enabling the aircraft to operate from land as well. In winter, or in polar regions, the Beaver can be equipped with skis, allowing it to land on snow and ice. The skis are designed to distribute the weight of the aircraft over a larger area, preventing it from sinking into the snow. This capability opens up vast, snow-covered areas for access, which would otherwise be unreachable for much of the year. The Beaver's cabin can accommodate a pilot and up to seven passengers, depending on the configuration. It can also be modified for different roles. The seats can be removed to make room for cargo, with the beaver able to carry up to 2,100 pounds, or about 950 kilograms of payload. It's not uncommon to see beavers transporting everything from groceries and mail to livestock and machinery in remote regions. Unlike other planes, all four doors of the beaver, two on each side, can be opened and even detached if needed. This was especially requested for beavers equipped with floats, because then it can be parked to the dock from any side. Over the years, many beavers have been modified to suit specific needs. Some have been fitted with additional fuel tanks in the cabin for extended range. Others have been equipped with specialized equipment for roles such as aerial surveying, firefighting, or even luxury travel. In case you are interested in buying one, you are probably interested in raw specs of this plane, just so you can plan your trip. Powered by its powerful PNV engine, 
Its standard fuel tank holds 95 US gallons, or 360 liters. Unfortunately, this old R985 isn't really economical, and the approximate range of flight is around 455 miles, or 732 kilometers. But you can always equip Beaver with aft fuel tanks, and in some cases, you could even double its initial range. In terms of speed, your maximum speed shouldn't exceed 158 miles, or 255 kilometers per hour, while cruise speed at 5,000 feet is 143 miles or 230 kilometers per hour. Equipped with floats, you can expect your cruise speed to drop to around 110 miles per hour due to increased drag. But all these factors aren't really crucial for bush pilots. Now what's important is the fact that V1 on this plane is around 70 miles per hour, around 110 kilometers. Incredibly low, but thanks to its powerful engine, it can maintain 1,020 feet per minute climb pretty easily. In terms of landing, stall speed is 60 miles per hour, with minimum runway length being 1,000 feet, just around 350 meters. The de Havilland Canada Beaver, despite ceasing production in 1967, remains an enduring icon in the aviation world. With hundreds of these aircraft still flying, their recognizable silhouette is a testament to their robust design and unparalleled versatility. What's more fascinating is how this classic aircraft has been adapted and modified to meet modern requirements and technologies. One company that has been instrumental in ushering the Beaver into the 21st century is Kenmore Air, based in Kenmore, Washington. Known worldwide for their expertise in servicing and modifying Beavers, Kenmore Air has developed a range of enhancements that have become highly sought after in the aviation community. So much so that a beaver refurbished or modified by Kenmore Air is often referred to as a Kenmore Beaver, or described as having Kenmore Mods. From structural reinforcements for increased durability to performance enhancements for seaplane operations, and from modernized avionics to extending the operational life of the aircraft, Kenmore's range of approved design changes cover a broad spectrum. They even specialize in rebuilding beavers to a zero-hour fatigue life rating essentially giving these old workhorses a new lease on life. Despite these challenges, the enduring popularity of the Beaver underscores its timeless design and unparalleled versatility. From its original incarnation to the Kenmore Beavers and Turbine Beavers of today, the DHC-2 continues to be a workhorse of the skies, serving in some of the most challenging conditions around the world. Thanks so much for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.